Hey, welcome back. It's time for Making a Connection, the Antera podcast. The one show, maybe the only show, where we show you what's behind the curtain here and how the challenges are of making a connection, keeping a connection, keeping them safe in an industrial environment. And today we brought with us the product manager, one of the product managers for Antera, David Zaveski. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me back. Product manager means that you've got to envision the future, not just today's needs, but tomorrow's needs. And that's what we're going to talk about today here. We're talking a little bit about the future, a bit, little bit about the evolution of industrial everything and the Internet of everything where everything is connect, connected to the Internet. My toaster is going to be connected to the Internet. I don't know who wants to know if I'm what kind of bread I'm uh, using or uh, how efficient my toast is coming out or how many pieces of toast. But those data points, as silly as that one sounds, seem to be collecting refrigerators, TVs, everything else in home environment. I can only imagine that it's even more in an industrial environment. Is that where this is headed? Yeah, McDonald's wants to know how dark you like your toast so that when you show up there, it's <laughs> the right way. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. As silly yeah. as that sounds, they want to know <laughs> what kind of toast is coming out of the toaster here. Uh, is the is the egg McMuffin properly toasted here? Yeah. So in that world, you must see some really unusual applications because you guys are brought in to connect all of these fancy devices, collecting data, controlling machines, controlling processes. They got to somehow connect to the internet, and that's where you come in to make that connection, right? Yeah, not just connection to the internet, but connection between things. Uh, yes, we're right. definitely more <laughs> in the industrial environment than we are in like the toasters and and household items. Right. Yeah. But the principle is still the same. In fact, it's even more demanding because uh, if my toaster data goes down, my refrigerator goes down, it's not the end of the world. But that's if my manufacturing data goes down or my machine goes down, uh, that's a big problem. It's a lot. It can be a lot of money. Yeah. Every minute it's down. Yes. And so, and we've been monitoring. We want to monitor. We don't want to send somebody to drive out there in a pickup truck and go out and find it and fix it. We want to, we want to at least Maybe we can fix it itself. Maybe it's a software problem. Maybe it's an adjustment we can make, or maybe we need to, we can shut down part of it and save the rest of it. But all those decisions are made in split second decisions. Yeah, we make all that kind of connectivity possible. One of the ones you guys have talked about, I know it's not on your list today here, but I just fascinated with it. Someday I'd like to have you come back and talk about it, are traffic centers. Here in Irvine or in Anaheim, apparently there's a building that looks like out of NASA and it's got a, a, like a bunker-like feeling to it somewhere. And inside sit these people in a windowless room watching endless monitor, traffic monitors, traffic cams, traffic data sensors, all this stuff. So that when something lets out, they can divert traffic and change the lights and move people around. I, c I can imagine it's even bigger around, I don't know, Anaheim and the Honda Center or something here. That's true. Uh, most of the intersections in around here are a great deal of the intersections around Southern California are interconnected with uh, networking switches and all that information is brought back to a central office and they can monitor what's going on and correct and change lights based upon this information. Change the flow of traffic yeah. in the moment, uh, divert it rather than the light went out and it's blinking and everything's backing up and somebody's got to drive out there and get through the mess. And I mean, they may still have to go out and do that and fix it, but at least we can start diverting traffic and doing something to keep it flowing and going. Right. I'm sure you've seen the movies where like somebody hacks into the system and gets all green lights or turns <laughs> every light red. Yeah. But that's a little <laughs> far fetched, but you know, I, theoretically it could be done. But I figured you guys have one of those. It's a little switch that Batman uses as he drives down the street and they all turn green here. Yeah. I've never told you that. <laughs> you didn't hear that from <laughs> you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, that's the kind of stuff we're going to talk about today. These worlds behind uh, the behind the curtain, what nobody's ever seen. And you guys are coming into the curtain because you're connecting the Wizard of Oz to his, uh, his to his wizardry, to his machines. Yes. Yeah. I think, you know, like you said, the IT, you know, ITS or intelligent traffic systems, that is definitely the one that I think most people can relate to. And for me, it's one of the more fascinating ones too because. Uh, you know, it's it's something, you know, that we can all benefit from, you know, tremendously. Keep the flow going. In Southern California, yeah. traffic jams, the number one complaint, along with uh, the sheer number of prices and everything else, sheer number of people <laughs> here. We got to keep things flowing and going on the freeways here. Believe it or not, it's not anywhere near where it needs to be yet. 
really, because yeah. that's we've talked about it and complained about it and invested yeah. so much in it for so many years. It's gotten better. When I first came here, oh my God, the gridlock was forever miles away. You just never went out at certain times of the day. It for it for sure has gotten much better, but. I think uh, someday somebody's going to apply artificial intelligence to the whole deal. Mm. Once every light is online, connected, and you let you know some Split artificial second. intelligence to go through this, it can alter the, the timing of the lights. You know, real time. Every light, every light cycle will be a different timing, based upon you know the traffic. But we just don't have the sensors, and all the lights are not connected enough to do that yet that's one of the big things i uh, we keep envisioning a road a smart road that literally has embedded sensors not just in the last 10 feet before a traffic signal but maybe forever and maybe the automated cars tap into this and use it for guidance and for other things here though the roads disrupted ahead here the roads slowed down or something they could use this data but we don't have what would it cost to embed sensors in every mile of every road well so that's that, that is good thinking i mean that's how we used to put these things called loops into the to the roads and you'll still see them uh if you look down at the road just before you get to an intersection you'll see a circle mm -hmm. and that's all our loop of wire and when you when you pass a hunk of metal over a loop of wire it creates a small current mm. and it can sense that a car is there Interesting. Now, I, I, I've never wondered. I mean, I've never. I've always wondered. I've never known how they know yeah, that's, that's happening. That's that's called you know. That's just a loop, and that's real old school stuff. Um, you know, nowadays we're really getting moving on to um, video. Ah. And so not not just I, I'm blindly sensing what's out there. I can see what's out there. Correct, and it works better in some places, obviously, than other places. Uh, you know, based upon weather. Here right. in Southern California, of course, it, it, almost everything works really good because we have such great weather conditions. It's not snowing. It's not raining, unlike, <laughs> unlike recently. But uh, right, right. Know. But even a light rain, you know, is okay. You can still use some, um, you know, video, and what they call lidar. It's a, it's a kind of a radar. Lidar. Using I hear light. that all the time. Yeah. It's like this little bubbles they see. And there's a we're at the <laughs> University of California Irvine Supply and Innovation Center. All this high tech stuff. They're coming technology from campus trying to turn it into real world applications and companies like many universities do and there is a car that drives around with one of these lidar bubbles on the top it's a self-driving car they keep experimenting with lots of them have a whole fleet of them yeah i think that ran into me today <laughs> <laughs> no no i'm just kidding the lidar couldn't see through the light rain <laughs> yeah. no um so yeah there's you know other technologies that are much better than you know having to you know put a sensor into the ground um it, we did that in the past and it was a good start but n nowadays think about how much easier it is just to put up a few cameras yeah and the cameras have you know the sensors and they can sense the car coming technically they will you know i've seen i've been at shows where they cars will try drive through an area and the uh they pass into the first camera entering the area and it tags the car with a number hmm. and the car passes through the area with this number the whole way through and in that way, it can optimize its path through there. And that's Amazing. that's where we're heading in the future. But Amazing. we're not really quite there yet. Well, and then because I know there's a giant company here in Orange County that's working on border security. Uh, the, the, the young kid, uh, Palmer Lucky, who started the Oculus Rift, has come back and created this company whose name escapes me off the top of my head. But... Uh, uh, and it's all about monitoring the border. Every turtle mm -hmm. that crosses, every body that crosses, every fly that crosses gets tracked, monitored, you know, whatnot, rather than building giant walls and building giant virtual walls. Yeah, and actually we get involved in that a little bit ourselves. We've, you know, uh, you don't know, uh, we've, we've been involved with some wall, border wall companies. Now, to be truthful, I don't know what wall, what border they're they're putting this up in. I, hmm. I have a suspicion, you know, those Canadians. <laughs> they're, uh, I don't, just saying. I'm sure I trust them all the time. <laughs> exactly. I think they're up to they're something. They're a little too friendly they're all the too time. Nice. Yeah. They're too nice. Yeah. And uh, nobody's that nice. Anyway. Um, Anderol. That's the company. Oh, Somebody Anderol. reminded Anderol. And they just took over the old giant uh, uh, LA Times printing press. They used to print oh, a giant yeah. thing up near uh, South Coast Plaza. So go look them, A-N-D-U-R-I-L. Sorry we're giving plugs to everybody on these shows here. But <laughs> but again, that's the future being visioned. It's about traffic control. It's about monitoring. Yeah. So the question always comes back to on this show, all that's there, high-tech stuff, 
futuristic stuff we can't even imagine. We're going to track the toaster. We're going to track the fly. We're going to track the car as it goes through the grid. How does that data get back? There's not a wire running back from that LIDAR to my computer a million miles away around the other side of the planet. There isn't a hard cable connecting it to it, so it's got to go through the Internet. It's got to go through yeah. Wi-Fi, and that means it's not secure. It's dangerous. And even more simple, what connects it to the sky, to the cloud? It's a device that you guys make. Well, we can do that. That is true. We can use our VPN tunnel technology and we can connect a lot of remote things safely. But when it comes to, you know, ITS or, you know, intelligent traffic and intersections, that stuff tends not to be put onto the internet. Okay. So that's all private network. Um, and where our, our primary function there is um, just a common Ethernet switch. We interconnect a bunch of devices. We put stuff over fiber. Mm -hmm. But most importantly, we have the feature set that allows us to uh, put protections in place that prevents anybody that might hack the system from getting very far. So, for example, uh, these switches are installed on roadside. So mm -hmm. if you're just driving down the street and you see a little box next to the intersection, mm -hmm. That box is probably running three or four intersections, but it has connectivity to the network in it. So if you were to break into that box, you could connect to the uh, telecom or you know to the uh, ITS traffic network and fool suddenly, with it. Fuck yeah, you could it. you could cause problems, but we can limit how far you get. We can limit that you can get to that cabinet and. The only that cabinet and do you get into any sort of encryption or is it just simply a, a dumb switch it's in and out no it's it's more like we only permit certain uh, he's trying not to give away all the yeah, secrets no 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 <laughs> it's it's uh so it's certain connections you can talk a certain pro, pro, you know a, protocol a, a certain protocol, protocol can right. talk on this but nothing else and it's it's called access control lists and it only allows certain data to go and the problem is, is that, or I guess the advantage is that if somebody gets onto the network, they want to use, they want to connect to other parts of the network and they won't be able to because you're not supposed to connect from that node to mm -hmm. another network. You can't node. use it as a back door into everything yeah, it, else. Yeah, it just doesn't work. So. so you're talking about controlling access in and then also the data out, right? You get yeah. to, the switch has got to work both ways. It's got to protect yeah. people from coming in and it's got to protect the stuff coming out. Well, you know, then you'll also have some protections on the whole unit there. You know, if there's an intrusion, there, there'll be an enclosure sensor. So if the enclosure is opened, the sensor kicks off and then that alerts somebody as well. Because so. we have many people come many shows. They said the dream that you can keep everybody out is a dream. The question <laughs> is get them as quick as you can and lock it all down. That's and right. Protect it all. Yep. And that's what all the, and so it goes down to that simple switch. At some point, it's got to connect all this fancy stuff, whether it's LIDAR and light kind of radar, or whether it's an embedded old switch or something or a piece of hardware. All that stuff's got to get connected into something. Maybe it's a fiber, protected fiber network, or maybe it's an, a, a less protected Wi-Fi network, but something's bringing all that information out and all of, and the control in the access in and that comes down to the switch and we always say that's probably the part nobody thought about that's correct yeah ever most people think of it as oh it's just a junction box that's right. how i connect everything that's up I picture it right but um and it is for your home that's exactly what it is it's a junction box uh but when you get down to more important networks you realize that it's not just that and there are tools if you better understand how it works that you can implement to uh, allow um, troubleshooting to yeah. occur much quicker. So we get we get better data, more secure data, better control, more secure control, yep. and and we get real time monitoring, which means we can get these, we can find the problems faster, maybe fix them pr faster, maybe reroute. So we can do all sorts of magic if we know what's happening. It's when you don't know what's happening and the whole thing goes haywire. Somebody's got to go out there and physically start pulling it apart and looking at it to figure it out. Right, and if you have to send somebody out there, that's that's a lot of money. And a lot of time yeah. and a lot of effort. And there maybe you don't have a big stuff. Nobody seems to have just endless uh, 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 groups, uh, armies of uh, engineers waiting to jump and react to this stuff here. We were relying on machines to monitor the machines. 
Yeah, well, we have to because there's less and less cheap labor available today. And, and not just cheap labor, but qualified labor. Yeah, well, that's the other. That's the that's the part that makes it not cheap. Yeah, right. Exactly. You can't just. I yeah. can't get my my daughter uh, coming out of high school to suddenly go monitor this stuff here. Or maybe she can. Maybe she's really good at. It. I don't know. All right. Well, uh, there's one world that I just am fascinated. You guys talk a lot about this this hidden world of traffic control, uh, of of transportation, uh, where it's all being automated. It's all being integrated. And you guys are the are that bridge that final little connector that brings stuff in and brings it out talk about some other crazy worlds uh, not just border walls and security and stuff you want me to bring up something called roaming wireless i don't even know what the heck that is oh yeah so roaming wireless is so we have a we have a really um, interesting application that we've come across with roaming applications so let me describe what roaming is first right because that that makes sense. So if you could imagine having a uh, warehouse, fairly large warehouse, right. and uh, maybe, you know, so big, so, so big that, you know, an access point, a single access point for wireless is just not big enough to hold the whole warehouse. Can't reach the whole space. Just can't do it. <clears throat> so you put five or six or maybe even a dozen access points throughout the um uh, the warehouse this building this building's three stories that we're sure. in and they have those scattered around i see them in the ceiling here yep and um so yeah once you have multiple stories then it really makes sense to you know that it makes it's clear that you need multiple access points but if you're on a uh, you know a, just like a factory floor or a warehouse floor you might have a automated robot that needs to go out mm. and go get some parts and and bring them back and you know, Got to drive down the aisle, go across this yeah. mile-long campus, and go find something here. A little fulfillment center, per right. se. Well, so as this little bot cruises along, it's sending information out about where it is, and it's gathering information about what it needs to go get. Mm -hmm. And um, as it's doing this, it needs connectivity, but it may go... Continuous connectivity. It can't go in and out of, uh, like, a bad cell phone signal here. Right. It, well, it... You know, it doesn't have to be like split second, but it needs to be, you know, it can't be down for a minute. Right. That's too long. It's going to bump so, into something. It's going to yeah. stop. It's going to get lost. So there, let's start off without any kind of roaming protocol. So the issue would be is if you had a whole bunch of access points and you gave them the same SSID. So that means that's like that when you're looking up a Secured access point. Secured something ID. I forgot what socket ID or something. Yeah, yeah. Right. And and so when you're looking up, uh, let's say you're taking your cell phone and you want to hook it up to a wireless access point, you'll see that it'll show up and it'll say, um, you know, Antera. And then you'll, oh, that's the one I want right. to join, right? So if you give all of them the same access point and, or the same SSID, and you also give them the same credentials to log in, mm -hmm what will happen is if if you're in the warehouse with your phone you connect to the first one and and everything is great and then you start walking and walking and walking and as that gets dimmer and dimmer and dimmer your access gets slower and slower and slower mm. until finally it's almost not working but you're still connected mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden bleep it'll go out of range right and at that moment your phone will go oh i better look for an access point mm -hmm. and see if i can reconnect and suddenly there's another access point that you're probably standing right under mm -hmm. and it'll go oh i found another one under the same name i will try the same credentials boom it works and i'm connected now that dropped the signal and picked it back up it probably took 30 seconds to a minute to mm -hmm. do that and that may be acceptable to some people but that's not acceptable to most people so they came up with this not the robot that's looking for that uh, <laughs> order to fulfill. All right, all right. And so Bumping they came up into each other. It's blind now. It doesn't know where it's going. For or it 30 stops. seconds, it, yeah. it, you know, the system didn't know where the robot was, and the robot wasn't able to get new information. And depending on how autonomous it is, that may be acceptable. But let's say it's not. And uh, so they came up with this protocol. It's, it's, a, it's a roaming protocol. And so what it does is as you are moving along with your phone in mm -hmm. the warehouse, the access points, they're all around. They talk to each other. Ah. They're constantly communicating, chit-chatting between each other. And this one says, oh, oh, I, got, I see Dave. He's, 
I mean, they don't say it this way, but the right. protocol basically I think does they this. They do, yeah. They say Dave. Dave Dave, uh, Dave's on <laughs> Dave's on the floor, and <laughs> right. and he's you know he's he's under me, so I I got him right now. And as he's as as I move he's away, he's heading your way. He's heading your way, and his signal's getting dimmer here. And I see that your signal, you see him on yours, as getting stronger. Yeah. Now he's not you know still you connected got him. through you the first you see him one. yet he's coming your way exactly and as there'll be a threshold when i when the first uh, access point says i'm handing off to you mm -hmm. and he'll hand that signal off like they would say cell phone towers hand you off exactly like other. a cell phone tower but not quite as efficient but it's very close mm -hmm. and um so boom you move over and you keep your connectivity and you pretty much didn't lose anything just nothing it's so how it's do you brilliant. not just communicate that's out of your valley wick but how do you keep all these access points connected to each other and connected to make one big rather than just a dumb thing waiting oh somebody came somebody's pinging me somebody wants to log in great i'm here so as long as they're all interconnected on the same network they can do this with no problem they can even do it if they are within wi-fi signal of each other hmm. but here's the here's the Here's the application that we came across. We came across an application just like this, but the access points couldn't communicate with each other. They couldn't communicate with each other because they were different manufacturers and they <laughs> didn't want to, somehow they didn't implement the standard correctly. So they wouldn't do this. And the company didn't want to replace all of their access points. They bought some a few years ago and they got a deal on some others and then they got another guy came up with a new one. And Exactly. So how did we deal with this? So we have You're the wizard. on our client. So this would be on in our example would be on your lap, on your cell phone. But this is on our little wireless routers. They have um, we have a protocol that we can put it into. And instead of having the wireless access points constantly like monitoring people handing them off and stuff like that we have the the client constantly looking around so it's it's connected to one access point but every few seconds it goes well, is there a better one hmm. and then is there a better one is there a better one and then eventually it says oh there is a better one i'm gonna switch over to that one and it connects to the other one and disconnects from the first one and it does drop it for about a second but a second is better than 30 seconds yeah or right. a minute yeah you found a way to connect things that didn't want to connect well right. all right that's fascinating well I, i'm going to give you a couple others i'm going to run by you quickly here sure this is one that i'm fascinated with because i'm in a video production studio or a radio station with video in it and more and more we used to just run wires everywhere to connect the cameras and wires to connect the mics and all this stuff and more uh and more of these things and then we had to, a lot of them had to have power particularly the video cameras. So there was a wire to, for the data. And there's a wire for the power. More and more of this stuff. Uh, and then I had to have a third wire because I had to connect it to the internet mm -hmm. unless I did it wirelessly. So wire in for the signal, wire in for the power, wire in for the um, you know well, other aspects that we're trying to, to send the signal and everything. Now they've got power over internet. And many of our stuff in here is powered that way so the internet is also providing the power to it what does that open so, up yeah so that's uh poe power over ethernet right and uh the way that works is that it literally can send dc power at the same time it can send a you know a, a signal a, a data signal over right. the same a wire. data stream right yeah and and this thing has been around for a long time and it's worked really great there's been a multitude of standards, but there's three basic standards at this time. There's 802.3 uh, 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 AT, uh, there's 802.3 AF. So AF was first and it provided 15 watts of power. AT provided 30 watts of power. Mm -hmm. That's great. And these standards pretty much work flawlessly. If you had a network switch that provided power and Ethernet, so it's it's the it's the giver, right? So mm -hmm. they sometimes call it a PSE, power sourcing equipment. So it can if it said that it was AT compatible, you could hook up any AF or AT because mm -hmm. it was backwards compatible. Mm -hmm. um, PD, which is a powered device, 
So that was great. And that could be a camera in my case, or it could be, is that what traffic lights use and other sorts of things? Um, not so much traffic lights. They use <laughs> quite a bit of power. So we haven't they need seen more than that. that. Yeah, yeah, we haven't seen that used there yet. Uh, but we're seeing more and more stuff. Primarily, we're seeing a lot of um, security cameras use this. Well, you gave me some other futuristic things. So if the lights, for example, in this room here, the overhead lights yeah. are powered by the ethernet, rather than just a regular electrical cable, I can send data in and instructions in and pull data out of those lights, and those lights can turn into sensors. Yes, so that is one of the, the cooler uh, applications that I've seen for PoE, where the light can sense if there's somebody in the room and turn on. But even more importantly, and maybe like a little too big brother-ish, I don't know, <laughs> um, it can sense Ooh. who's in the room. The little badge, the little <laughs> something. The re, this, it, uh, Paul's in the room. Paul's badge is in the room at yeah. least. Yeah. If Paul's in the room, we're only going to turn on half the lights. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it would work. Yeah. So um, now uh, I'm, I'm using everyday ordinary lights. Maybe there's different kinds of bulbs or I, mean, I, guess, I guess there's some evolution of light. But it's basically still a light. It's just illuminating the room. Mm -hmm. But I'm no longer viewing it just for that one purpose. Because I'm running in... POE switch to it, I can hook it up to the internet and therefore I can add more functionality to it sure. and it's overhead and it can be gathering motion, gathering data. It'll, it uh, could be a wireless access point. It could be yeah. also a camera in, built oh, into there. Wow, yeah. It can be a lot of things. So it's kind of a little scary, but kind of cool at the same time. Yeah. Because like everything means, in the internet, kind of scary, but yeah. kind of cool. Yeah. It means that, you know, our lights are producing, you know, we're able to power these lights in under 30 watts of power. Right, where back in the day, it could be a 250 watt light bulb. Yes, right. Now we're drawing so much less power. Especially as you go to LED and all this yep, stuff. It, yeah, all right. of these are LED, low power. All but right, yeah, go there ahead. There is one other standard I didn't talk about, which was BT. I so, wasn't gonna bring that one up, but go ahead. Yeah, no, that's the problem child. <laughs> I know that. No, yeah, stay away. because that's the one that, um, you know, it took them a long time to ratify it. So companies didn't wanna wait. Now this, BT is capable of producing up to 100 watts of power. Wow. Um, yeah, you could run a toaster on it. Yeah, um, a very high intensive yes. you know, a, a room heat or a space heat or something. something yeah, 100 watts is yeah, a I bunch mean, of power. It's a little bit of power. It's yeah. not the low voltage uh, lights in the backyard here anymore. No, yeah. no. And it's expensive to implement at the time. But because they waited so long and because surveillance camera manufacturers needed this power, because they are producing cameras that have windshield wipers, heaters, you know, they can tilt, pan, zoom. Oh my gosh, windshield wiper on that. Of course, so yeah. you can see through the rain. Yeah, the snow. yeah, and heaters so that they can melt the ice. Yeah, right. So they needed the extra power. So the problem is, is that they decided, you know, each manufacturer decided, well, I'm gonna implement the standard this way, and I'm gonna implement the standard that way. And everybody can follow me. Yeah, and so nobody guessed exactly how they would get how the BT hmm. standard would be ratified, and so now all of that doesn't work right. But not well together. It doesn't play well together with others. It right. doesn't. But at Antero, we're able to get into these things, get into our devices, alter them slightly, and we've been able to get quite a few products to work that haven't worked in the past the name of the show is making a connection yeah. that's what you guys figure out how to do this old stuff the new stuff the stuff that wasn't uh, i didn't know there was a standard that was loosely ratified <laughs> or agreed upon i thought they would spend years defining wi-fi you know, something something and this and that i thought all this stuff's well thought out bluetooth and all this stuff they can't just be yeah i sort of do it this way and maybe you do it another way but you said in this instance it's more like that it, that is the case and that is the problem but and tear to the rescue you're we, the wizards we have a solution you figured out how to connect the unconnectable here well i i gotta ask you had a whole long list of other crazy ones here we talked about border walls we talked about my favorite traffic control this idea of roaming wireless and handing it off and and keeping it up and what i've been learning about power over ethernet because that's how we're running a lot of our equipment in the studio particularly in remote rooms and stuff and sending data in and and getting on the internet so we can live stream and all this stuff that we never could do unless we ran lots of long miles of wires to do this here now we can do it with one wire all the other one talk about elevators 
Oh yeah, this is a good. I'm one. always scared of riding in them. I always think I'm going to get stuck or something here. But and so, or it's going to fall. Or I, I'm I'm old enough to remember when they used to do that kind of stuff. And now they've got huge standards to protect. They're, they're safe. They're incredibly safe. But yeah. they're also, I guess, not so easy to maintain anymore. Here. Well, the, you know, elevators are uh, heavily maintained. Like, there are a lot of reg rules and regulations for maintaining elevators, and that's the reason for their safety. Always working on the elevators here in our building. Yeah, Always. and that's because they have to. They're required to review and and uh, you know get information from the elevators every so many working hours i don't know exactly what the standards kind of like are like a jet engine that can only run so many hours until they get to take it apart and look at it here. exactly and so that's what keeps it safe right and so one of the things if you've ever really watched somebody do it the first thing they do is take the panel off the mm -hmm. front of it and they hook their computer up yeah because just like in my car the first thing the technician does is hook the computer up because there's somewhere in there telling something that's collecting data and telling them what's wrong right right that's exactly what's happening in the elevator it tells you how many cycles what it's done all this information well what if we made a device that plugged onto that interior device and now all you do is have to walk in with your laptop and connect to it okay be kind of nice right found it simpler but it's kind of scary because then couldn't anybody do that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So the terrorists who want to crash yeah. the building or whatever. I don't know. That's the image I get from the movies, but it could be something even less terrifying. But just just I don't know if you want to assassinate somebody, you can let them get in the elevator and you drop the elevator to the bottom as quickly yeah. as possible. Or lock it, it might or control do it. it or do something. Yeah, I don't I don't really know. Um, but I've all watched too I'm many pretty movies. sure that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's uh, I've watched too many uh, movies for sure. <laughs> but the, the data is sensitive, and uh, so they don't want anybody in it. So we were able to create a, uh, a, a an encrypted, a specially encrypted connection mm. between the elevator and the laptop. And it's, it's only encrypted to certain um, uh, devices. So if you have one of those devices, you can connect to it, but you have to have one. The encryption key that lets you into this whole yep. thing here. So all of a sudden that data, because again, it's transporting people and we don't want people fooling around with it just because they think it's funny or for malicious purposes or for whatever. I, I can't believe the reason. I still don't know. We should do a show on the hackers. I don't understand the <laughs> hacker mentality. People go crash systems just because they think it's cool, just because they it's bragging rights. I don't get that world who want to put people in danger, uh, ground planes, uh, uh, crash systems, uh, bring down banks, open up uh, uh, prison uh, walls and other things. I don't get people who just want to do that for fun, but there's a bunch of them. Yep. It's, it's just, it's just somebody to see if they can. Just, can I do it? Yep. Can I beat the impossible yeah. here? Uh, I, I remember watching a show years ago, the old Charlie Rose program. You had one of these guys on from, they call it anonymous, this giant hacker worldwide organization that people somehow join and become members of. And they do it just because they think mayhem and anarchy is kind of fun. And it's a bragging right to see if I can do it. And they literally do all those things that talk about crash airports, crash banks, crash government computers. And they finally caught one of these kids who was doing it. And you would think he's an MIT or Harvard mastermind. He was a kid from the Bronx yeah. uh, and living in the projects, self-taught. And he said, I had endless hours. I just sat and experimented this stuff where the people sitting in some foreign country just endlessly tried these things just to see if they can do it. It's, it that's a scary world that I can't really wrap my head around, but we all live in it. And, and as this stuff is all on the internet, we gotta be cognizant of it. That is true. All right, comes Antera to the rescue. They can not only connect the stuff, maybe they can protect the stuff along the way here. Uh, and then solar. Everything's solar these days. Everything's going to have, have oh, solar yeah. power. And then that solar power has got to be powered somehow. I don't know. It's got to it's got to connect everything. And then all that's got to connect to the Ethernet because I'm out in the middle of nowhere now. And yeah, so the solar oil, arrays oil are... Derrick or something being run off a solar <laughs> array. Yeah, yeah that would be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just uh, thinking wild applications. You stuff in the middle of nowhere now getting power from the yeah, sun. Yeah, yeah. So we... we put in and we've got involved in an application where a very large solar array went into the desert and um and when i say large it was it was acres, really acres. really big yeah they're building some giant ones and um so the 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 
challenge was is that there there are what these things called pods right and a pod is a series of um solar panels and a controller and um you know it it basically they don't take all of the solar panels across the entire array wire them together and then figure out how to convert them to eight you know power right they have a regulator take for the dc small power groups. and turn it into ac yeah. power. Right. so they have they're they're in groups so they 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 bunch them into groups called pods and they want to gather the information from these controllers and bring them back to make sure that they're functioning correctly and see if they need to be replaced or whatever some of them move too because they want to follow the sun absolutely yeah. do actuators to move to uh, follow the sun and these did that as well so there was a lot of information coming back well instead of putting a network switch at each and every one of them and mm -hmm. running fiber to each and every one of them they wanted to only run fiber to one out of every 10. and then those we cheap used... guys right <laughs> well the the data is very small right mm -hmm. so it's not a lot of data and it would be a little overkill to 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 run a switch to everyone so what we did is we created a little um uh we used a Zigbee data stream, which is kind of like wireless, uh, you know, Wi-Fi that you would use for your laptop, but a little different protocol. And we created a micro network uh, around that one pod that was connected. And it allowed the other nine pods around it to, to connect. connect. Yeah. And so now we only needed one tenth of the switches and they only needed one tenth of, run, you know, fiber running around. Wow. So we cut their costs considerably and allowed them to interconnect the uh, whole array you guys really are magicians you get called in do you, do you anticipate you're the product manager so we started this thing do you have to go out and anticipate you sit in a room and envision where are we going what are we going to need to do this or is it all adaptive you get called in and go well, i never thought about that and most people put a switch on every one of these little pods you only want to do one out of ten hmm how do we do that well, I should have I should have brought in my crystal ball, <laughs> and we could one. do a whole podcast on my crystal ball. Yeah, really? no, seriously, there's no crystal ball. It's um, some of the stuff is a little knee jerk reaction. Uh, you know, customer brings in a crazy idea, and we try to make their their make crazy idea reality. Yeah, um, doesn't always work, but it you know we try our best, and that's kind of the fun of my job, is that aspect of you want you want to do what? Yeah nobody's ever done that how do we do that yeah. yeah constantly macgyvering it you know you're trying to figure out how do we glue this uh put a piece of gum here and do this I, I know it's more serious than that but you're trying to on the fly adapt to something uh, that nobody ever thought of you, you've got a new application a new idea and you guys get caught in to connect it to make the connection yeah yeah and you know if it was we just have some amazing engineers i have to say that uh, that's the only reason that we're able to do these kind of crazy things is we do, we do have some of the best engineers. And I would think that's not to, uh, not to give you guys too big of a pat on the back, but I wonder if everybody who else play, makes internet or ethernet switches, they may be very good at manufacturing stuff, but I make this. And if you want something other than this off the shelf thing, I don't want to adapt it. I, I, I want to make this over and over again. That's cheaper, faster, more predictable. It's the 10th generation. I know what it's doing. But if you want to go into customized creativity, I would think a lot of manufacturers wouldn't want to play in that space. And that is true. Uh, you, you hit the, the nail on the head there is uh, Antera is a little bit more creative. We listen to our customers a little bit more. And as long as it makes some economical sense, we're probably going to go and work with them because yeah. that's kind of more fun. <laughs> <laughs> Business isn't about fun. It's no. about profit. It's about uh, predictability. About fun. We have fun there. <laughs> Well, I have fun every time you guys come in and talk about this stuff. I tell people about this podcast and they, they shake their heads, their eyes go roll over and they said, you talk about what? Industrial Ethernet switches? How do you do that? For more than two minutes. Because in the process, you show me a world I've never seen before. And you take me behind the curtain to where the wizards are trying to make the whole thing work. And I think that's fascinating because that's that hidden side. So it's sort of like Disneyland. You go to Disneyland and you don't see anybody cleaning the place. They're all underground. They pop up, you know, they... Uh, the Mickey never takes his head off and walks around to go get a Coke, the guy inside the costume. It's, they maintain the illusion. It's a, it's a hidden world, and you guys live in a hidden world. Yeah, I would like to see Mickey without his head. <laughs> Wouldn't that freak? <laughs> well, they think it would freak out every kid if Mickey take his head off and suddenly walk down the park here. 
I don't know if you guys have. You must have space costumes. You must have something that keeps you anonymous. Yeah, it would office. be cool if we did, but we don't. <laughs> we don't. <laughs> well, to me, you're all spacemen flying in the future here. What is the least thought about, least worried part? How are we going to connect these things? It's all about first lay it all out, get the equipment, get the sensors, get the cameras, get the futuristic stuff. Uh, I, I also love the one you guys talked about before. We won't go into it now, but some sort of crop thing that somehow carefully picks strawberries in oh, this machine. the strawberry picker. Strawberry yeah. picker in it. It gently, the robot gently reaches and lifts the leaf and takes a picture. And is that one ready to go? And then it finally plucks it gently and pulls it out. Uh, that's wild for picking strawberries. Yeah, we have another one that's a weeder. He uses weeder. a laser beam. And it <laughs> shoots. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's experimental. <laughs> Let's get that one. There's one. <laughs> yeah, it does. It, as, it mows, as it goes over the crops, it sees it can identify a weed over a crop. Wow. And it just hits it with a little laser beam. And all of that's got to be connected because somebody's yeah. got to control it in. they got to get the data out. they got to monitor it. they got to do all these things. And that all requires what we think of as a simple switch. Ain't so simple. You guys are being very adaptive uh, as well as hardening it making it uh, redundant and work in crazy crop fields in the middle of nowhere and at the bottom of a mine and all these things that you have to uh, extreme environments that you have to deal in all of that makes for a fascinating story about a world i've never seen before the world of making a connection thanks for coming in again today uh, thank you for having me well there you have it as i said a world you've never seen before make you think it ain't so easy making a connection but more important than ever join us again for future episodes of the Intera podcast streaming live from our studios here at the university of california irvine beal applied innovation center